Hello, Shimmy. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Shimmy King, Life of Shimmy. Yes, Life of Shimmy. <laughs> you are in Winnipeg, Canada, and you have three children. Yes, three amazing babies. Well, always babies, yeah, but three kids. How and old is your youngest? Is is that seven? No, Story. She's okay. the youngest, and she's two. Yeah, she's two. Not even two and a half yet. I can't wait. She's two. Seven is almost four. He's going to be four in May, and Soul is going to be 17 in June. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. Are you going to have any more children? I want to. One more. One more. I need my, like, wild pregnancy, wild birth, wild baby. So I think once I'm like, okay, I'll take one year to just kind of clear my body, actually do this conscious conception, and then I'll have the, the pregnancy of my dreams and the birth of my dreams. Yes. I am. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So you're a birth keeper, a postpartum doula. Yeah. Yeah. Can you can you tell me like your your evolution of of becoming a postpartum doula and getting into birth work? Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Um, I think I genuinely I always had an interest in it. I think since becoming a mom with Soul, I was uh, 17 when I was pregnant. I had her at 18, and I had this just a genuine curiosity for. The process, I think at the time I was doing what I thought was best. I was like, oh my gosh, I want to have a natural birth. And to me, natural meant no meds in the hospital. Like that was my idea of what, you know, it was going to be. Um, so I did have a hospital birth with her. I didn't have any medication. So I was like, oh, it's great. It's great. Um, <laughs> I did choose to have an episiotomy with her, which was with probably one of the worst decisions I think I've made. Um, and after that, I just kind of went on this path of like, just curiosity about women, womanhood, pregnancy, birth. Um, my postpartum as well was awesome because I was, I had her in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, like the islands back home. And so I did have this village, like my mom took care of me. I didn't have to do anything, which was really nice. Um, and so when I decided to have a baby the second time around, it was quite a bit different. I was a lot older at the time. <laughs> Um, and for me, migrated to a new country. So we've been here with no family. And I was like, okay, we're going to have a baby. We got pregnant. I wanted to have a home birth with midwives because I didn't know that I could have a baby outside of the system at the time. So I was like, okay, I'm going to have a birth center or at home, no meds, natural, awesome. And it went left field. It was horrible. Um, it was really, really traumatic. Uh, the birth ended up being uh, transferred over to hospital care and just traumatic. Uh, it was induced. My watches were broken for like almost two days, 48 hours. And then it was like, okay, you need to have a C-section. Okay, we need to keep checking you, which I'm not sure why. Um, I can go on and on about how horrible it was. And at that point, I just kind of had enough. It was like, I had to be more intentional about what I was doing. Also, I didn't have a village, so I really suffered a lot mentally in the postpartum period doing everything alone. And then I started to really dive into, okay, what would it take to have better care for women? Um, what would it take for have better care for Black women and, and be more attentive to what they needed? What would it take for, I started just being curious and questioning things. And then I started studying. I took a doula course, which was, in the system doula course. Um, and it was everything that I I was doing before, but still I was doing things that wasn't like a doula, like under the table. I was like supporting women with options and telling them that they couldn't do this. They didn't need to do that. So I think for myself, I was already a birth keeper, but I was under the, the term, the umbrella of doula because I didn't realize, or you can still get in trouble for not being a, medical doula hair or medical <laughs> midwife mm. so it's it's something that I kind of had to skirt around quite a bit and so now I'm just I'm not in that space anymore I'm just saying it I'm doing it and I'm not I don't want to be a doula of the system I want to be a doula outside of the system which I am practicing and doing every day and I share about every day um so yeah that's that's kind of where that went just my journey of motherhood and constant curiosity with life and changing and what it means to be 
natural and organic and what it means to not have an like an undisturbed birth and the benefits of an undisturbed birth on the postpartum period on a mental health on the mom's mental health mm. so I kind of focused more on that because I experienced hardship and I just started to fight the good fight yeah. mm, wow so important well, yeah. can you can you tell me more about I'm I'm really curious about the birth culture in St. Vincent because you're from there, right? Yeah. Tell me about mm -hmm. that. I would say it's a big uh, a great mix, sorry, of traditional and modern. It's like I think like everywhere we see now capitalism, right? It's easy in everywhere. Um but it's still a great big uh, mix of like traditional, not so much with birth itself. Um almost all births are in hospital back home at this point. Um, there are still some traditional bird attendants, but again, they're undercover because they're no longer recognized as um, healthcare providers. So if you're doing that, it has to be, okay, I'm going to have to seek one out somewhere who is willing to take the risk with me. Um, uh, so that's typically the culture. The care, however, is a lot different. It's still very traditional. So you would find even in like the rural areas um, where there's still like... Uh, Caribs, you know, different tribes, the family takes care of the mom. Um, so uh, pregnancy, the food, the nutrition, it's all about that nuclear family care, um, postpartum care as well. They still have that family structure, which I think is definitely a need and a must <laughs> for all moms. So yes. they take care of her, they make sure that she's well, like they feed her. Um, and like I said, even in my um, postpartum, which was like uh, uh, 17 years ago, my mom, I had nothing to do. She cooked for me, like she put the baby to bed. I was just supposed to breastfeed and just exist, which I think is, is so important for mom. So there's still that traditional culture to an extent slowly it's kind of going away but I would say it's a great big mix of of that which is the care but births are still within the the hospital which is something I I don't understand but again they're they're wiping out this idea of of what birth should be and traditional birth attendants are no longer healthcare providers mm. which I don't understand but yeah yeah um, also a lot of times um I recently had a mom because I do a lot of support work there I recently, my friend, she actually went back home. She moved from the U.S. to go home to do that. And she found a traditional birth attendant and she had a home birth, undisturbed pregnancy. Everything was awesome. And then she wanted to come back to the U.S. And it was such a fight because she had the baby outside of the system and she had to get a birth certificate that they wouldn't give her. And so it became this continuous fight and she had to pay to get a birth certificate for her child and somehow leave the country. But it's definitely, definitely um, sad to experience that. <laughs> wow, that sounds rough. Right now, I still, I have to go to court uh, to get Bjorn's birth certificate, which I haven't ordered yet. I have to order a court hearing. So I'm, I'm still in the process of doing that. It's just a lot of friction and uh, it's, it's, it's rough because I didn't have live proof of pregnancy or birth which is, it's, it's my mistake, right? Even, even with women who are giving birth outside the system, we still right. live in a society. The yeah. The system. And you got to do what you got to do. If, if that's what it takes to, you know, get one visit, right. The chiropractor right, or, or something, a, yeah. Someone yeah. to write you something. So for those mamas out there, first time moms who are going to have a wild pregnancy and free birth, uh, get a note. Prepare. Yeah. Prepare. <laughs> prepare. So I, yeah, I want to kind of get into why do you think postpartum is overlooked everywhere now I mean even in 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 Thailand I it wasn't like that before oh what can I say <laughs> besides capitalism society um I think there is right now I think maybe over even like I want to just to minimize it if I'm going to the last 50 years I think there's a lack of awareness and education on what actually happens to women in the postpartum period the emotional ups and downs um and there's no way to truly do that if you're not being told the truth, right? So there's a lack of importance placed on the care of that mom because you're not aware of what she's going through. Everybody's just like, okay, just have a baby and move on with life. So that lack of awareness, I think really, okay, I don't know what to do. So it's not important to place care, you know? I also think that there are a lot of cultural like attitudes that are really, 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 really heavy on women in today's society it's like have a baby bounce back 
Mm -hmm. Not even sure how that's possible, but that's the culture that we live in now. So how can women really slow down and take time to understand, okay, I need to recover when there's so much pressure on, no, you don't need to recover. Go have surgery. Go not breastfeed your baby and just go, you know, like move on with life. So I think that the cultural pressures around it as well, quite, quite heavy. And I don't know, especially being that vulnerable in the postpartum period, you'd probably do anything that you were pressured to do if you don't have the right support. Yes. (laughs) It seems like even some moms brag that they're able to already go out and and go snowboarding after a few weeks of having their baby. Completely, completely shifted from what that care should look like. And if I'm going to go back to like society and the capitalist, you know, you know, system that we live in, there's a lack of policy support around (laughs) women and what birth should be like and the recovery period. Like, how do we have a baby, an entire human, and then we expect to not even have, not even paid maternity leave, right? We don't have, some people don't have maternity leave. It's six weeks. I know in St. Vincent, it's based on what you've accumulated. So you could have six weeks or three months. And if you go past six weeks, it's, you don't get paid. So at that point, it's, there's no support for <laughs> mom's recovery. Yeah. And it takes about, according to research, it takes about 18 months for a woman to fully recover physically after childbirth. So you're telling me a mom should go back to work after six weeks, after three months. Yeah, that's that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, for me, even being quite a fit person as, as a personal trainer, it's almost been 11 months postpartum. I haven't yeah. worked out. Right. My husband says um, I'm getting soft, and, <laughs> but I feel good to not. My yes, focus absolutely. is on my baby and to relax and, you know, absolutely. and I don't feel rushed to get right into it, you know, but yeah. I can see how 18 months is, is necessary. It is. I feel like I'm just coming out. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And the postpartum period, according to society, is six weeks, okay? That's the fourth trimester. It's six weeks. Like, you're supposed to be fine after six weeks in the culture, mm-hmm. which is insane. And then if we add on that, like the healthcare system, if you were to have a baby in the hospital, and we see it all the time, priority is always on the, the newborn, not the mom, not mom's care. It's like, okay, the newborn baby. So how do we then mother the mother? How does she know? You know, how does she get the attention that she needs? You know, how do you trust her voice? Mm. There's so much that goes on mm. and why it's overlooked and why I feel like mental health issues is such a thing right now. It's such a thing because of of the lack of support for mothers, lack of recognition for the journey. And that the first year of life, I, I always think to myself now knowing, which is what I want to experience and every mom should, the first year of life should just be you on a couch, literally breastfeeding, feet up. You don't have to shower. You don't have to cook. You don't have to do anything. Mm. You should just be so focused on that bond with your child and you healing yourself, which is that bond with your child. This this almost circle and this connection of concept. You nurse, baby grows, you love baby, you give baby attention. It's just a cycle. And I think once that's respected, society would be such a different, different place. Absolutely. Can you tell me about, you know, this is like for, we're talking to first time moms who want to have a home birth. Right, right. So tell me about, having a home birth with a medical licensed midwife versus a home birth with a lay midwife or a birth keeper? Yeah, honestly, because I did have a, a home birth. I, midwife, I've never had a, a wild pregnancy, which I'm excited because I think you've shared your journey and I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I'm going to ask you a question after this. <laughs> but um, in my experience, I, I thought like with my last, it was very healing, but in comparison to the second, that makes sense. So um, it was very, very not as transactional as my um, meetup with my OB for my first pregnancy. But for for first time moms, I think it's that bombarding in your space, like that that constant somebody's there. And even with my my midwife, I had to say, I don't want to be checked. Like we talked about this before, and I was like. I don't want to be checked. Please, no vaginal checks. And she still was like, I'm not sure. I need to check. Like, there's still this this anxious energy that 
that I felt and I've heard from other moms in their experience as well. And feeling like there is an authority in your birth that isn't you, like somebody else is in control regardless, which which is a it's not a good feeling for if you're having you're, you're giving birth, you're having a baby, just feeling like somebody's in the space and telling you what to do and cutting your cord when you don't want them to cut your cord and checking you when you don't. So even if you're home, you're still not having your time by yourself to do what you need to do for your body to do what it needs to do. Right. That that was just in my experience and just from stories that I, I was told about, you know, like midwives and mm-hmm. just having one myself. It was just in comparison. And my my last birth was at home and it was the same thing. I felt so somehow safe to be in my house, but not safe at the same time. Mm. <laughs> it felt like I was in control, but not in control at the same time. Somebody was always like, no, I have to check. No, you can't. Don't hug just yet. Let me just quickly check. Let me wipe her down. Let me clean her up. Let me just so many things. And I just wanted to hold her and and all this, this good stuff. And And for me now, as a birth keeper, I approach it so different. And in my experience, I feel like I walk into mothers who are in full control of it. I am just like a, a keeper of their space. I am just there and I'm just existing with them. I'm cheering them on. I'm supporting. And I'm just, we're here. It's almost not even like we're here. We're just, there's no hierarchy. It's just a peaceful space. You walk in and mom is ready and she knows what she wants and she knows what she's doing. And I'm just, okay, I'm here when you need me. I'm here when you need me. So it's more of a, in my experience now as a birth keeper and the, the two births that I've attended since becoming a birth keeper, that's been my experience with the moms being in full control and relax and um, me just having to almost play a role and keep space for them. Just hold space, make sure that they're fully ready to do what they're doing. Um, so I think that that's just my experience from both sides. Um, and I, I just can't wait to experience more, hear more stories. So maybe if you can just tell me what you felt like having a wild birth. Yeah, you know, it, it is interesting. What's the well, experience like? Yeah. Well, it felt... It felt so good to not necessarily the word be in control, right? Like that's the plus, that's the plus, but it's just to feel relaxed and Mm. not observed and going at my own pace. Mm. Yeah. And just being, it's such a vulnerable time. Yeah. And it just felt, it just felt right. It just mm. felt good. It felt um, very natural. Yeah. Like I am just in my own home. Yeah. <laughs> you know, being butt naked, not not worrying about the other person, whoever mm. is trying to hold the space for me. I mean, mm. I even had my in-laws and my mom ask, like, you sure you don't want us there at your birth? Mm. And I was like, no way. Wow. You weren't anxious at all? Or did you have any anxiety? I didn't. Wow. Because all That's I, beautiful. yeah, all I knew was I, I needed, uh, was, was my husband and, and God yeah. to witness mm-hmm. and, and, and to trust that whole process. Yeah. And yeah. I've heard so many stories about women who, a lot of women ha- want to have a wise woman. And most of the time, women who want to have a home birth, they're actually not, what's the word? Um, they're not expecting to call the, the midwife. <laughs> they're hoping that they, yeah, they're like, I'm just going to hire one, but That's I don't true. plan to, to call until much, much later. And, and most of the time, it's for after the birth, for the cleanup and right. for the, the postpartum help. Yeah. Majority yeah. of the time, I haven't heard a woman wanting you know, a, a midwife right then and there, like, right. like during, during the birth, because I think it's such a vulnerable time and they're just right. letting things go with the flow. Um, and then yeah. I've also heard women who do just want, you know, if their husband or partner can't hold the space or their husband and partners don't want to hold the space, they do just want that wise woman to witness them. Yeah. That's it. Yep. To not, not do anything. And yeah. that's been my experience in the last, it's just being there. 
And should they need me, they would call, oh, I need some water. And I'm just there. Okay. Yeah. I'm right here. That's all. And I'm just doing my prayer. I'm just tidying up, just trying to be as quiet as possible and just being without being involved in a yeah. weird way. Um, and even so, that, yeah, that tiny reassurance because yeah. even a phone call, because I have Yolanda, uh, our mentor mm -hmm. on, on call. And I, I called her a few times and all it took was you're doing fine. And I was like, yes. okay. <laughs> and I think that's all, all women really want deep down. Yeah. I think that's, that's very, very true. And I would, it's quite, I don't know if I should say it's very different for some reason in the black community, it's very different. You see it in little pockets because I think now women are more questioning and pushing back. Like, no, this isn't like we're dying. You're not listening to me. And now it took that, I think for especially black women to be like, yes, okay, no, I actually have to pay attention. I actually have to do some research. I actually have to question things. I, you know, I have to do this. And still, which is why I do so much more like activism, like, no, 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 like I'm post, don't do this, don't do this, because I feel like there is a lack of awareness around just the entire process. Like, just because the doctor said, which I did as well, when I moved here and I told you, um, it's like, I didn't know. So I just went along with, I didn't know I could choose to have a baby outside. And I thought if I did it, I would go to jail. So I, you know, like, I just, and I didn't even think to, no, go online, go research, find a, a group, find a platform and question, ask moms who've done it before. So I think that's what a lot of my work is doing now in the community. It's like, okay, the awareness of, and putting the information and sharing stories of this is actually possible. It's actually possible. You were meant for this, you know, like this is how it's like, you go to the bathroom to take a poop. You go to the bed, you go in bed at night to sleep. It's it's a natural part of being and womanhood, you know, <laughs> rite of passage. <laughs> uh, so that's a lot of the work that I find myself having to do, which almost takes away from the birth keeping because it's like this constant education or re-education or, you know, information giving about, okay, this is what you, you can do this. Forget everything. You can do this. And we need to do this. So we can be healthy, so our children can be healthy. Like doctors, lawyers, um, the next doula came from a woman. And if that woman isn't cared for and you aren't given a proper care as a child, how can you be a successful human? How can you be healthy mm. and nurtured? And the next doctor, should you want to be, right? But that's just my view. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing more women of color. I mean, even Asian women and Black women having a family birth or a free birth. However, it's still not the norm. Like, why do you think that is? I mean, I, for, for Asians, I think even Asian Americans, I feel that we're very much in the box and to please our parents and to praise anyone that has authority, like doctors. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's just appeasing someone else. At least with, with, yeah, I mean, maybe that, that's the same, but what, what do you think? Yeah, I absolutely think it's the same. And <laughs> granted, there, there's been a lot of trauma through the years with, with the races, right? There's been a lot of, okay, no, let's practice. Let's get our tools out and let's teach Black people something. You know, let's see what they cannot do and can do and their, the limits they can go and how strong they are. Uh, and I think that's just passed down over time. It's not, I don't think it stopped one place. It's just like, okay, we are so used to, like you just mentioned, um, somebody being in control and not wanting to be responsible for what is what is us not wanting to be re removing responsibility from self to put it on someone else. I think that's what it is. And that could be fair base, obviously, because like I said, of what happened, a lot of fear, but I think it's just removing responsibility and I think once that's taken back where you're like okay no okay and it's just realizing too like just to touch on briefly you have a baby in the hospital you have a baby at home baby can die does it it doesn't matter it doesn't it doesn't matter but I think 
just the idea of knowing even like I said when I was pregnant I was like oh my god I wanted to have an ultrasound I was so paranoid is he okay like is everything gonna be fine I wanted to know the gender I wanted to I'm not in control and what is to be will be and I think once I realized that everything else just kind of shifted everything else just shifted for me and I think that's what it would take for people but for other women but that's a huge step in saying hey I I, I need to be responsible I need to take ownership of what I'm doing and just remove that and and the fear of what society and the doctor and my mom and I know um even my husband um his his dad is a doctor and I was like no we're gonna have midwives and even him he was like don't no 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 what if something goes wrong they don't have all the tools they don't have everything that you need you need to go to a hospital so so stuff like that I can see how that's just being repeated and said you know every day and you just you believe it but at some point, you're going to have to remove yourself, take back your own, you know, ownership of it, take responsibility for what you're doing and just walk in your truth, like walk in what you know is self, walk in what you know is like womanhood and motherhood and just own it. And I think once we get to that place, oh, it'll be freeing, but it definitely is a process to, mm. to unpack and untalk all that trauma and pain and just say, hey, no, it's okay. It's okay. You know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That it is a huge step. It is. <laughs> it, is. it is. Even with, with your husband freaking out. Yeah. It comes down to, I mean, even, even my family and, and most people, they don't understand how physiological birth works. So works. tell me about what is undisturbed birth? What is physiological birth? Uh, well, I think it's just the, the process of allowing your, your body to be, I don't think it's complex at all. It's just, not having anyone involved in the process, not cutting off, not trying to shortcut, not trying to um, dismiss, but it's just, I think being, which is how you explained it. It's just, to me, it's a form of just being your complete whole self. It's trusting, it's knowing, it's understanding that you are completely out of control and allowing it to be. That's my my view of what uh, physiological birth is. There are so much intricate steps in it, you know, like hormones involved, this unfolding, that. But that's to me what it is. It's just a complete form of being. You don't need to make it complex. You don't need to involve anybody else. It's just a knowing and a trusting in the universe, in self, in what you are designed to do and not having anybody or not trying to shortcut that. So for example, for me, I was at 40, I don't know, 40 weeks and I was tired and I was like, can't take it anymore. I could find all the excuses. You know how, how women are at the end of pregnancy. I don't know if you experience this, but at the end, it's just so tiring here. Oh my gosh, this baby isn't coming. I don't know if that's a mix of excitement and anxiety. Just like, I want to meet this person. But here I am at 40 weeks and then I stupidly decide, okay, I'm going to have a sweep. Why? Why? But now sitting back and knowing what I know, I can tell you, baby is the one who starts um, labor. We don't need to rush that process. Everything will happen when it's meant to happen. There's no due date. And I was going based on the, the midwife said I was due in this time, but she doesn't know when I conceived. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so for me, there were so many things that I was like, okay, but here I am saying I trust myself, but I really don't because I am trusting what she said. And it's completely give me the worst birth. I take so much responsibility. And I think that's why I can say it so much because I realized I was the one who decided to stupidly involve people in the process that my body was doing. I didn't trust it. I just second guessed myself. I was fearful. I was listening to my mom, Arrow's dad, everything. And I also was older. So I was like, my body isn't the same. You know, I was okay, my first pregnancy. I was in my prime. I was healthy. And now I was like 32 and like, I don't know, feeling aches and pains and discomfort and complaining and this and, and I wanted to just shortcut it. And I disturbed what was supposed to be. I disturbed the process. And then I paid for the process. I paid for disturbing it, you know, I suffered through it after the fact. So I think for me, how I describe it, even to like moms, it's just a state of being, allowing, trusting and knowing that it is what it is. And don't shortcut it. Like everything is, is is difficult. Everything is gonna be really difficult, especially childbirth. It's it's a whole an entire transformation internally, externally, 
mentally, emotionally, physically, in every aspect. And you just have to trust and know that it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me if one were to sh shortcut a birth, what, how does that impact? Why is that important? Why does it matter? <laughs> it matters because your mental health, it disturbs the process of bonding. It disturbs breastfeeding. It disturbs so many other physiological processes between you and baby. Everything, everything is just now on a waiver, which is why sometimes, not sometimes, in most cases, when you disturb it, you need a breastfeeding support. It's why, okay, why is my baby crying so much? Why am I not bonding with my baby? Why? There's so much <laughs> physiological process that affects baby and mom after the fact. It really, really, you shortcut, shortcut. There's a saying in, in, in my country, shortcut, break your neck, you know, like shortcut really does breaks your neck completely because you do that you interfere with it and it throws off so many things in your child developmentally in your in your healing process alone so yeah it really cuts off quite a bit I would say there's a lot of struggles after which is why um like I said mental health issues like depression anxiety in mom postpartum depression is on a rise um, um postpartum anxiety is now a major major thing um breastfeeding I am not sure why women all of a sudden cannot breastfeed which mm -hmm. I know why but <laughs> yeah <laughs> women something. women are I thinking that their bodies are broken because their baby won't latch or that their something is wrong however it is the birth it always yes. goes back to well what was your birth like right absolutely that's exactly where it goes back to and I think that's where the the education must and I, I said I love what you're doing because it's so important to share that no, this once you have, and I've never met a mom who has had an undisturbed birth, who has struggled with the, I, maybe it's just me. I have never met, I have friends, I am in Facebook groups, I have never met a mom who is miserable, postpartum, who had an undisturbed pregnancy and birth and delivery. I have never, I've never encountered that. Yeah. I've always encountered happy moms, conscious moms, like, and my child is outside, my child is functioning, I'm breastfeeding for three years going on. It's just, I, that's all I've met. So that tells me, it's very telling, right? It's like, yeah. yes, of course, this is, this is why it shouldn't be messed with. I've never encountered a mom who's lived that life, had that experience and complained. Mm -hmm. It's only been, I scheduled a C-section and this happened, or um, I had a sweep or this, or it's just, yeah. It's always been a hospital birth. Yeah. It's always been something of the sorts where somebody else was involved medically. And then all of a sudden, there are all these complications. If you were a first time mom, right? Give, give me the steps to set up and plan postpartum. So, the support system, which we can then segue into the village. I think identifying people in your life who could be of like emotional support, physical support. That's key. Every kind of support as a mom that if you get pregnant, I think the first thing you should start thinking about is like somehow support. If you have, like most people now in today's society who have migrated, you don't have your set family structure. I think that is absolutely key. Identifying those people who would without issue or without questioning you just, okay, I'll step in sometimes if you need like just maybe some reassurance reassurance you can call me on you know this day this person is my reassurance person this person is my food person different things like that but I think identifying and building a support for the postpartum period as a new mom is absolutely like essential you have to do that that's the first thing I have here also if you don't have that or even if you have it I think a must is a postpartum doula consider it um, doulas may be pricey. Some of them might not charge, but I would say consider a doula. You can start saving from the time you find out you're, you're pregnant until the end. You can ask your family to contribute to your doula fund if they're away. But I think really, really, really having a doula is essential again for every mom, family or not. Having somebody there with you who has the experience, who can take care of you, who is that wise woman in some way to you be there I think that's that's really important I love that um, idea having family and friends contribute into a fund just like they would for 
your honeymoon and yes. your wedding. Yes, absolutely. I didn't even think absolutely. of that. I love that. Yeah, that's super, super, super. I think important. Um, just as I would um, preparing for physical recovery. So ask your birth keeper and do your research. What would physical recovery look like for me? What can I expect? Um, what do you know? Like who? You know what were your experiences before? With that being said, I always advise to set up a little cart for yourself. Have a little postpartum cart, you know, if you're going to make your ice packs for your postpartum healing, you know, your perennial area, if you're going to have your pads, if you want to make snacks for your breastfeeding, have a cart set up for things that are a must, must, must. Um, that's super important. And then be flexible, be flexible with time, with your emotions, um, be prepared for all the emotional up, up and downs, as prepared as you can be. That's why I said be flexible, because sometimes you might cry, sometimes you might be fine, and sometimes it might be something else. So I think those are the things that are really, really key. Another thing I'm going to mention with the postpartum planning and the, the doula and the support, have them contribute to a food plan as well. So for your mother blessing, write to your friends, give them all notes. Hey, you bring a lasagna, you bring me some bone broth, you bring me, you know, this, and this is what I'm expecting from you, you know? If you don't want to bring these things, contribute to my doula fund. So those are things that I think as a new mom can be super, super helpful. Having food in your freezer, having your friends bring food for you, having your friends come and clean for you, having your friends and your village contribute to that fund for you. Absolutely things that that I think are essential for a really successful postpartum period, you know, like mother in time. <laughs> I love those ideas. Yeah, and it's just, even instead of having a baby shower, just have a mother oh, blessing. Yeah, yeah. Like, forget the baby. I'm taking care of the baby. Take care of me. <laughs> yeah, and babies have enough stuff. I mean, I yeah. thought I needed five onesies that I got at the <laughs> thrift store. I ended up not using it. Yeah, I think that that's the culture we're into. Like, just you have to have so many things, physical, materialistic things um, to be successful when it's not that. It's like more of the emotional because... Once mom is good, baby will be good. Once mom is rested and fed and nurtured and cared for, oh my gosh, breast milk is flowing. She is relaxed. She's happy. Oxytocin is going. There's just this relaxed atmosphere and she thrives when she's able to relax, right? Mother thrives when she's able to relax and just be with her baby. So yeah, I think those are really essential for successful um, postpartum period for first time mom, second time moms too. Like, come on. <laughs> yes I love that yeah. did and you made you made broth and stuff right you made bone broth and stuff for you I didn't I didn't I'm a foodie and I'm a cook and I didn't I bought an instapot but we didn't even touch it I really just thought I'll be able to do it yeah. but I didn't do it I thought my husband would be able to do it, but he didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> and now that I think about it, sometimes we think, you know, because we are new to this town, but sometimes we think, oh, I don't want to bother this person. However, I truly think people want to help. Yeah. They want to be part of something. It's just our mm -hmm. human nature to yeah. contribute. And mm -hmm. so if if the thought crosses a mom's mind, like, oh, I don't want to bother them. No, they're going to be do happy it. to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you do have to speak up to an extent. And we, we do have that culture. It's like, oh, no, I'll, I won't ask because I don't want to bother. But yeah, I think there are people who are like just willing. If you say that's why I said, write the note to your friends, like just you bring me lasagna, you bring me this, you bring me some soup, you listen. It's, it's so important. Yeah. Beautiful. Boss them around. <laughs> yeah. One of our RBK sisters, actually, for her like kind of baby shower mother blessing she's having all her friends come to her house to cook to and then yes. freeze that's yes like, that's, that's genius idea. I love that that makes things so much easier <laughs> so we got um a few questions from Instagram and I think we have time okay for for two questions okay okay this is from the dot sovereign dot rose she asked what is the best thing for first-time moms to focus on postpartum? I know that's, <laughs> you kind of mentioned it, but what, what yeah. would you say? The best thing? Oh, I, I, I don't, there's no best thing. I think just relaxation. <laughs> that's, that would be the best thing. Um, if you're talking about something specific, I think it would just be more mom-baby 
but I don't think there's um yeah other than like resting I don't I don't think there's anything a mom should be focused on in the postpartum period other than herself recovery and that's even too much of a mental load so that's why you plan before for what's to come and you just assign and let people do it so that you can be your full self I think self should be the only thing um postpartum because baby like I said would always be happy as long as mom is fully fed and nourished um top to bottom so yeah I don't know if that answers her question but okay and Gemma 007 asked <laughs> 007 <laughs> What are the tips? Yeah. What are tips and remedies for nipple care when breastfeeding? Ooh, that's a really, really good one. I honestly, the only thing that I've ever done, well, I'm I'm gonna it's it's a little bit extra because first pregnancy and other moms as well, I did the only thing I use on nipple is coconut oil. I do not, I don't advise anything else because of course, toxic this, toxins that. Coconut oil is probably the most natural organic thing you could do. It helps clean baby's mouth as well, which is really, really awesome. It just keeps your nipples moisturized and it's really just healthy fats, right? It's just good fats for baby. So even before, um, if you're a first time mom, I just recommend if you have some time, um, because there's often buildup on nipples um, before pregnancy. I don't know if you noticed that there's often buildup on your nipples before and you do have to sometimes like wipe. So I think coconut oil and just if you have inverted nipples as well, that's really helpful just massage them a little bit from time to time. And then once baby is here, I would say that's the only thing. Keep your nipples dry as, as long as you can, as much as you can. And then coconut oil is about the only thing I always recommend for any like chapped nipples, if they're dry, if it's painful, but also if it's painful, it means that there's a latch problem going on. Um, so that's something that you probably need to look at. But I think honestly, just letting it be unless you have nipple, inverted nipples or something, but I think just coconut oil is what I recommend and uh, care and noticing of how your latches and what's going on, but keep your nipples dry always. Yeah. Okay. That's very helpful. I have personal postpartum questions. <laughs> okay. When will my luscious hair return? <laughs> I've been, I have like these baby hairs that I lost. I don't know. Like what? the post did you experience I think postpartum hair I loss I did it okay. was terrible and you know what's funny not with my daughters but for some reason it was with my son it was so bad I just remember like the fourth month and all of a sudden I had pat like front I had no hair it was so bad it was falling out it was really really bad and honestly I would say it wasn't until probably like 10 months like later on maybe I, even after a year it started to actually come back into itself but I experienced it with my son, not with my girls. I didn't, I never experienced postpartum hair loss with the girls. I'm not sure why. Okay. And I think every woman is different for sure because I've had some friends or women with daughters who have experienced it. But honestly, with my son, it was like, I needed a wig. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but a, yeah, I'm not sure. Thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, will my boob stay saggy? I think so. I think it's sexy. I think it's a part of, and Often, let me just, first of all, correct something because I always hear women say, oh my gosh, I'm not breastfeeding because it makes my breast saggy. It is not the breastfeeding. It's that your, your breast went up a huge amount of size and it's heavy and it's carrying milk and it's doing its thing. And then it just eventually breaks, you know, which is, it's totally fine. And I, it's just sexy. It's a part of, I think, accepting what the new normal is and this new chapter of motherhood and, and womanhood is going to look like. And yeah, I have two chicken cutlets right now, and that's totally fine. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I okay, because it's funny. I mean, it's amazing that I feel like after pregnancy and, and birth, I finally get to reflect on what my own mom went through. Mm, yeah, you know, I've seen my mom's body, right? But you don't really know why or how it happened. It's like, yeah, she had babies, but then once I experienced it, it's like mm -hmm. my body is like my mom. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you feel about your body though? Like you like it, or you're still working through? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm still working through it. You know? Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think you. I think you will forever work through it. I like I like mine now, but it's still a work through because then I'm like. 
okay, I've, I've, I've lost weight, you know, I've lost a baby weight and my boobs are definitely saggy and I've lost all my stomach fat, but I still have a lot of skin that I'm like, okay, okay, this is new. This is okay. This is fine. I've had three babies. This is fine, but it's still a process. I think every day you wake up and sometimes, you know, stories like playing with my tummy. I'm like, oh gosh, oh, it feels weird. It, you know, it's uncomfortable. And she's pulling it like Play-Doh. <laughs> Yeah, it is well, what it is, but definitely oh, a new normal. Well, I have okay, and then one more thing because, mm. well, in terms of bras, I, yeah. I I stopped wearing underwire for a while, but I was looking for I guess regular sports bras don't support because I do want to start jogging and all that stuff again. Okay, okay. The bras I used to wear, mm -hmm. I can't wear now. Right. Would I go up in a size or now find underwire sports bras? Like, what do you do? I, okay. I do. I very rarely wear bras. And if okay. I do, it's yeah, without I don't wear wire bras. Okay. I just wear like, yeah, what do you call it? Uh, like sportsy bras that you, let me let me show you. I don't it, it has okay. no support. I just okay. I'm in a constant state of like, let it be. Um, yeah. But I don't know, because I don't I don't know that that's good for you. Like having wired uh, uh, bras, I just feel like you should just kind of let them be if you're running, though. Maybe a sports bra that doesn't have a wire. Maybe yeah. it might hold it closer together, but yeah. Okay. I don't wear. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting back in the gym soon and stuff. You're thinking of it. Once Bjorn turns one and yeah. once the weather gets a little more warm, I, I do plan to. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. Should be good. Yeah. You've had a lot of time. And I think by then too, you look at your body different. And then since you've been in the gym, I'm sure you're going to be like quite buff pretty soon again. <laughs> It's just mental. I, I like to feel strong, you know? So, yeah. It's all mental work. Oh, you got this. I'm excited for you. When you're in the gym, I might have to take you up on some classes, like, because I need some help, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, my gym is my house, so I will definitely, yeah, whenever, I, I can definitely uh, write a program for you and, and yes. do a workout together online. Yes. I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> and like I said, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. It's it's really important, you know, I, I feel like there's um, so much work to be done with regards to just um, women in general and, and, and how we are being treated and are mistreated and are not recognized. But what you're doing is super important. And I am so thankful for your page and your channel and may it just continue to grow and reach who it's supposed to reach. So yeah. Thank you for, for your you. sweet words. Oh, tell me about your new project, Shades of Mom podcast. Oh my gosh. Tell me about my that. new what little baby. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's just like we are sharing a lot about um, navigating motherhood and womanhood in like this 21st century. Um, and I, it, the first episode is out, but I'm hoping that it grows from there. We've recorded quite a, a few now and just a flowing conversation and maybe uncomfortable stuff that people wouldn't want to hear, but um I'm really excited about it any opportunity that I get to like talk about women and birth and um how messed up the world is today I'm I'm so so thankful for the platform so that's kind of what it is so Shades of Mom podcast yeah it's on Apple um iTunes uh podcast it's on Spotify as well that's all for right now um and do follow us if you can on Instagram at Shades of Mom pod and um yeah yeah, it should be good. And I appreciate any feedback, any feedback at all. I really, really appreciate it. It's really helpful. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs>